Hi, everyone. And um, I am going to sort of hide behind here a bit because I've got like notes on, on here. And um, it is going to be a bit of a ramble, I'm afraid. I, I had to be at um, site meetings all day today, so I was uh, probably not edited as efficiently as I should have. So um, I hope you find the ram ramble a bit interesting anyway. Um, now firstly, thank you very much for the invitation to come and speak to you this evening. Um, I think, you know, as a student, you don't quite realise how rare it is an opportunity to speak to architects about design rather than, um, I guess, what you might call for promotional purposes, you know, at awards presentations or, you know, things like that, which are basically um, sessions where, you know, everyone's trying terribly hard to impress each other and to win something over another person. But to actually talk about design itself is actually quite um, uh, a rare opportunity and there aren't too many forums for it. So, and it's, I think, one of the things that I never really um, realised when, when I was a student, how rare this kind of environment is to actually be able to talk about design. Because you'll find when you leave university, there aren't that many other people that are that interested. You know, the, as one of the things is that it's... Um, you know, things, derivatives from the work that we do, such as photographs and images, and especially the way they're distributed on the web, are, um, you know, are things that are very easily consumed by people outside, you know, the general public, people not directly involved with design, and the way that they'll engage with it is largely sort of from the outside, like, oh, that's a nice light fitting, where did you get that from? I love those tiles, you know, all these sorts of things, but not actually, um, they're not able to be, um, rather than they're not, interested in the actual sort of des the design process and also the generation of the ideas that go into sort of making those things. Because to a great extent, I guess, when you actually look at a building, you're actually looking at the shell that's outside the ideas that generated it. It's just a product of various, um, you know, any number of things that might have come together in a soup to sort of make that thing. And when you actually look at it from the outside, you don't necessarily understand those things. And um, there aren't too many opportunities to, I guess, you know, discuss what sorts of things might go, go into that, that sort of generation. Um, okay, it is going to be a bit of a ramble, but I will start off with maybe just saying a little bit about um, my practice, which is small. And in some ways, when I... Um, first started my own office, it was mainly to run away from working from other, for other people. And in some ways, that is a huge liberation in itself because things like that Tom mentioned, like, you know, being able to do things like run a film society or be a director of an architect's co-op, you know, and, and, you know, various other things that um, I enjoy doing. Like I took a, um, a walking tour for Jane's Walks on the weekend. You know, all these sorts of things are, you're given the independence to pursue a whole lot of other things other things that you can choose to do because you've got a pretty, you know, especially as a sole practitioner, it's a pretty lean, mean operation, um, but you have incredible flexibility and then a whole lot of other things that drive you nuts. But um, yeah, essentially I, I work from home and I work almost exclusively on residential projects and not necessarily because I chose to do that. Um, I think like a lot of people that Initially, you know, when you start your firm, you kind of think, oh, you know, we'll do a few renos, fix up a few bathrooms, and we'll get better at projects, you know, later. And what I actually found was that I actually really enjoyed doing those. I do the occasional shop or bar or something like that with, um, with friends in collaboration, but um, mostly I do houses, and in particular, like the couple of houses that um, Tom mentioned that I will talk to about tonight as well, are more and more of the work is actually in very um, heritage heavy areas where there are a lot of conflicting um, uh, concerns and very active neighbours who are terribly interested in everything that happens in their street. Um, in my practice, I actually work, I guess, in what you might call a studio sort of situation. So my partner, David Brand, is also an architect but he would call himself a lapsed architect because he works most, mostly now in um, planning and heritage consultancy and things like that. And also has recently been um, re-elected to the City of Port Phillip Council, so now he's a politician again. And we basically work in a studio environment, I guess you might call it, where we work on our own projects. 
but we feel very free to give unsolicited advice to the other person all day, all the time. And um, in some ways that used to drive me crazy, but in fact I found it's actually a really great way to work because you, give, you can give fearless advice when it's all okay, care, no responsibility. You know, so it's actually purely um, I, a, a purer form of criticism, I guess, than if you were, your ego was somehow bound up in that project. Because ultimately, even though the other person can advise as much as they like, you retain complete control and veto over the actual project. So it's actually quite a good way to sort of bounce ideas around while at the same time um, you don't feel like you actually have to compromise where you're going. Now what I was wanting to talk about tonight was, I guess, with the in particular sort of focusing on those two projects, a Hello House and Acute House. Uh, the, the, they are, I guess, two projects that play with um, an idea about inside and outside that I think are really, um, uh, well, interesting is not really the word, incredibly useful sort of uh, way of, of thinking about um, work. And maybe it would be, you know, I guess the roots of it would be in um, actually way back at in a university subject that I took, probably the best, best subject that I, I ever took and I sort of accidentally took it. It was an elective. I didn't really know what it was about. Um, it was a subject run by Professor Haig Beck at uh, Melbourne Uni and it was called, um, I think it was something like graphic analysis of, of architecture. And essentially what it was, was focusing on one architect and learning about that architect purely through the dissection and analysis of drawings. Um, so it was just, you know, it was actually quite a pure sort of exercise in a certain way and high, highly theoretical in a certain way, but it was also completely spatial. So it wasn't interfered with by, you know, other, other things that might be social, cultural context, you know, other historical sort of background. It was purely about the building itself, the, the way that it, it worked and what you could actually perceive and derive from just looking at it. Um, and one of the, I was very lucky to have chosen Adolf Loos as the um, a subject for, for my study, which was a bit of an accident because I didn't really know anything about him. Um, I didn't know what I'd chosen. And it, but I feel like in some ways it was actually um, one of the luckiest things I ever did because a lot of the things I learned sort of through that subject and through um, studying Lois are pretty much sort of um, kept, kept, with, kept with me today and still informs a lot of the um, work that I'm interested in. So first slide up is of course um, Adolf Lois and Adolf as all of you will have studied in history you have covered him in architectural history? Yes, no? Yes, of course. Um, and if you haven't, you really should. Now, as a, I guess as a man that was living in the, um, at the turn of the 19th into the 20th centuries, it was really a huge, a huge time of change. Um, so at the same time, there's, um, you know, change in terms of a lot of, uh, I guess a diversity of architectural ideas when people didn't really know what direction they were trying to move in, but, but they were trying to find some sort of idea, um, direction to move in, but also a huge social and cultural change as well. Uh, and the, I guess one of the most famous things you would know about him would be this, uh, an essay and also a series of lectures he gave and eventually sort of became, um, I guess a, a small book called Ornament and Crime. And, the salient thing here being it is ornament and crime, not ornament is crime, which is often misquoted. It's actually a much more um, complex and fascinating idea than it seems from the beginning. Because if you only think about it as being an anti-ornament um, or anti-decorative kind of uh, um, principle, it really is, that is only the very surface of, of what that means. It's actually a far more complex idea about um, the use of ornament, um, the, the people that have to make ornament, what that actually means uh, to, to waste your life, as he saw it, to make um, decorative, useless things, and what it means for people who actually desire to put on um, decoration. 
So there is, it is actually a very interesting read, but it is also full of weird 19th century prejudices. So you will have to um, check yourself when he actually talks about, um, uh, you know, primitive races and all the rest of it. But he is, uh, you know, he was a man sort of like born in the um, 19th century. So you will have to forgive him for that. Now, one of the most interesting things about Loos was he actually wrote about many things besides architecture. So things that are, I guess, when you look at the, the severity of his um, presence uh, and also what we come to, the way that we come to think of him now as a very severe kind of person, um, that he was very interested in the general sort of pop culture of the day, in fashion, in clothing, in decoration, um, in cooking, in like, all sorts of cultural pursuits. So he wrote um, uh, quite prolifically about all sorts of things like creating your home with style. Um, this is sort of how to, uh, how to decorate your apartment. Architecture isn't art or when, when, why is archi when architecture is not art. Uh, he put out a magazine called Das Andre, which is, basically means the other. And in it, one of the telling things is these, um, oh, use the pointer, um, ads for English tailors, English tailored clothes, which was one of his main obsessions was the idea of clothing and the idea of appropriate clothing. And this is not merely a, um, I guess, a fashion thing, but is, 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 you know, fashion is part of it, but it is actually an integral idea with, um, uh, many principles of architecture that he, he goes on to practice. So this idea about, you know, what is the appropriate way to dress, um, what is the modern way to dress, um, are all things that he was quite obsessed with and wrote quite a lot of, um, quite a lot of work on. So in many ways, I guess you could say that he thought about architecture as a form of clothing and that you should be able to, uh, and that you do actually read architecture in the same way that you might read clothing on some you know, on any number of people that you might meet. So this would be, um, I think this is the Mueller house, whoops, sorry, and this is the Zara house and the Steiner house. So these are your well-known images of what you think Lois's work is like. So it's very severe, blank, cubic, like quite, quite harsh in some ways, and basically so blank that you can't read anything of what is actually the interior life of the house or the interior life of the inhabitants, which is its specific purpose, is to not, um, is to present a respectable face, much like, um, I guess if we go back to the um, gentleman suit, although that looks like a um, captain actually, um, you know, the idea of an English gentleman suit, that it, it's, it's a respectable suit that you put on to, um, uh, I guess, reflect a, uh, you know, in a way, it's it's a uniform that reflects uh, respect for your fellows, but you don't need to tell them any more than you than you than they need to know. And I think we all have friends who overshare on social media, so we know exactly what he means by that. And there is, um, I think, particularly at the moment, a um, probably a need for quite a lot of people to rein themselves in, because there's only so much you want to know. Because on the inside of these very severe houses are often these very rich interiors. So the I won't, you know, go through any of these in particular, except for maybe this particular one. If you're ever in Vienna, there is a bar, a tiny, weeny little bar called the American Bar, which is this this interior that Lois has done, which is fantastic and still going today. And one of his most famous interiors is this is his own bedroom. So you have this incredibly severe front on the house, and yet on the inside you have this furry fantasy. I don't really want to imagine what Mr. and Mrs. Lois are getting up to in their furry bedroom, but they are obviously, um, you know, love the, uh, I guess, the, the separation, the dichotomy between their public persona and how they would respectfully present themselves in public and the sort of wildlife that they might have at home. You know, and no one outside needs to know about that, just like no one inside needs to sort of behave in this um, very disciplined sort of like public way when you're actually at home. So I think those particular ideas I've, I've always really loved, that, that you would actually have an interior life that is free from the um, gaze of the public. 
But at the same time, there's a way of presenting yourself in public so that it's not, um, I guess, excessively, it, you're not an excessive imposition um, on other people around you. So whether that's um, about, you know, this idea about oversharing detail about your lives or whether um, it's an idea about um, being emotionally incontinent, if you want to call it that, um, and needy. Uh, but that there's different ways of conducting yourself that make it much easier for other people to be with you. But at the same time, you know, it's, it's all orbits are off when you're actually home. Do whatever you want. So I thought maybe I would just walk through a few, um, I'll, well, I'll flick through quite a few actually images of the Hello House and the Acute House in particular. So that, um, and maybe talk about some, how some of those ideas have been played around with in, um, in these particular projects. So in a certain way, I guess you might say that um, the first thing we do when we have a look around a site is one, you know, someone might say you would look at the context and the council would like you to say that. But in some ways I would actually look at it more as um, uh, these are the existing, the original existing site of the Hello House. I think to a certain extent it's also, it's partly walking around, getting to know your neighbours and see how people are dressed for the party. So, you know, for example, these sorts we do, I mean, we, we are required to sort of put in some of this material for planning purposes, of course, but we also, we would do it anyway, whether or, whether or not council required it. So if you actually look at the buildings around the site, um, I guess you get to know your neighbours. You know, you find out um, where, where the... Um, <coughs> where the presentation um, of the personalities in, in that street are sort of pitched and what, what year are they coming from, what, they're, what different things that they're, they might be trying to tell you. And in this particular street, even though it's actually quite a heavy heritage area that they consider to be Victorian, in fact, when you look around, it's actually full of um, brick, brick um, I guess, you know, expositions or um, ideas uh, from all different eras. So you've got like a 60s um, uh, brick, you know, um, six pack kind of slight kind of nightmare at number 35, but with actually quite an interesting sort of texture front. Next to that is that dark grey building that you see there at number 41 is actually a very, a very well known house by Robinson Chen, who I don't know if you know much about their work. It used to be painted in incredibly bright colours, but um, sadly, you know, um, more conservative people who have bought the house since the original owners, who were um, the founders of Lonely Planet, um, have actually made it much more demure. And then various other ones along there, their 50s, 60s, you know, like um, 70s, sort of like concrete, concrete blocks of flats with the um, gum trees out the front. And so we, when we looked at our site, it was trying to uh, make friends, I guess, with the, or get married, I guess, to the front, to the front of, the, to the front of the house, or make the, oh, I'm sorry, turn that off. <laughs> sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so how do you make the 21st century sort of meet the 19th century, basically? So the, the Victorian front part of the house we had to keep, and the rear, which was uh, basically, you know, various sort of lean-to structures and what have you, they just basically had to go. We actually tried pretty hard to keep them, but it was simply impossible. But we ended up with this situation where we actually have a, um, you know, this very big sort of blank wall on the street. That's actually what makes the whole thing work in this very compact site. But what it means is we put up a big blank, you know, sort of fuck off wall on the street. Now, the first question I guess you might ask is, you've just moved into the neighbourhood and then you go to the neighbours. I mean, like, is that the way that you want to, um, you know, introduce yourself to the area? To you know, is that the personality that you actually want to present to your neighbours and possible future friends? You know, this, this environment, you sort of come in there with your new extension that basically um, blocks everything out. So we thought that there was... Um, you know, it's a, in, in some ways this project sort of highlights the how kind of little and how much you need to do for that sort of stuff. So we, we actually did work quite hard in terms of um, um, finding a way to, finding out what to say um, to the neighbours, like how, how do you actually want to talk to 
to the people around you. Um, maybe just very briefly, the, the house previously didn't have any sort of northern aspects, so this sort of little entry courtyard here was the only way that we could actually bring north light straight into the house. And then this space at the rear is essentially a um, car parking space that we had to retain for um, planning as part of our planning permit to retain on the site. And then, uh, which means basically when you're actually inside that, when you're actually in the site, it's an open tube that you look right down um, from the carport, right into the um, garden in the front courtyard and vice versa, so it's completely open. But when you're actually um, on the street, you see nothing at all. So this is our first literal idea. We thought, oh, we'll make it out of bricks and we'll just make it nice. You know, it'll be nice brick, it'll be nice colour, that'll be good. Um, but it's just too blank. And so we worked with quite a few um, different possibilities. This is a project by Mark Kohler in, from the Netherlands, who worked with this fantastic um, uh, texture, which is it's incredibly simple. So it is still, it is essentially just Flemish bond with the, um, uh, the perpendicular bricks, like pushed out a bit further. And he actually used them as a way of sort of marking the corners. Um, and we were playing that with that for a while and we thought, oh, you're making a pattern like what sort of pattern, you know, a random pattern, like a nice pattern, you know, what, what do you do with that? I mean, is it just a meaningless piece of dribble that just goes across the front of it, like a meaningless piece of decoration? Or, you know, is, is there, you know, shouldn't it be part of what you're actually saying? Um, and very luckily for us, the, um, our client for the house is the artist Rose Nolan, who some of you might know. And she, we worked with her on and off, I mean, you know, very closely with her on this project. And we spent a long time going, what do, what do we want to say? What do we want to say? And then one day she just said, well, d hello? <laughs> and it was in some ways like a throwaway thing at the end of a meeting. But it was also the, the thing that we'd been waiting for. Um, so I can't sort of make it any more sophisticated an explanation of like why hello than that um, other than um, it was such a simple idea, it was the perfect thing that we were looking for and Rose who actually works with um, text and graphics all the time is actually uh, an, an amazing wordsmith, like a single wordsmith if you like. If you actually go to see any of her, of her exhibitions they often focus around a single word and the re rendition of that word in a particular way, often on an architectural scale, like gigantic things. And um, so it's basically like this was the, the answer to everything that we'd been looking for. And the, um, this is a little bit of her work. Sorry, I probably had that asked about. And just a detail because your architecture students and you're one of the few people that would be interested in this. I won't go through that in, in any detail, and I'll just flick through these quickly so you could, because you are students, that you may actually be interested in the construction process. So we had to actually build the inside leaf first because we had to hang the um, trusses for the inside before we completed the outside. Now this is um, the builder and Rose discussing a um, variation. One of my favorite photos from the construction period. And this is Rose and Ian, sort of a, uh, the first time they could stick their heads out of the um, O window as, as the letters came up. Because the builder was quite paranoid about uh, graffiti, he actually had the hoardings up until the very last minute and sort of uh, just all this sort of like stuff up in order to keep people away from the wall. Uh, at, which actually worked very well for us because when it was actually completed, it was a bit of a grand reveal. It was suddenly like everything was stripped away and it was, hello. And they were on the opposite side of the street is um, uh, the neighborhood cafe. So basically everybody from the whole neighborhood gathers in and around that, that area all the time. So they'll pick up a coffee on the way to walk down to Richmond Station to you know go to work and that sort of stuff. So it's the equivalent of a, um, a civic hub in that, in that area. And in many ways that also informed I guess the attitude to this wall and how just a blank wall was not going to cut it because they, we had other civic duties, if you like, um, for this building, even though it was just an extension, um, that belonged to a neighbourhood um, civic uh, sphere, if you like. So on a very, very small scale, 
um, it is a little bit of a civic monument. Uh, beautiful detail, thanks to the um, roof plumber, which I will tell you about because once again, you wanted a few people that may be interested. See this little slice in the brick here? He went through and he saw cut every single brick on the top and tucked the flashing into it so that um, you would have a beautiful, um, whoops, uh, we'll get to it later, um, profile so that when you look up, up, up the wall to the sky, the actual profile you see against the sky is not a fat bit of flashing that goes across like that, but in fact the serrated edge of all the um, bricks that come out. So it was, it was a beautiful job. It was um, painstaking and mind-numbing, but he did it all and it just looks fantastic. So that's, that's what happens when you keep your good tradies on site. Um, just a couple of things on the interiors as they were being done. You know, some beautiful things that are actually lost in the construction process. So this is actually the hydronic heating system going in. And it just looked amazing. The, this, uh, it's a styrofoam insulation that you clip the um, hydronic pipes to. No one will ever see that. And happy days when they're finished. But, and also this is for um, professional practice for you afterwards. When you actually finish, when the construction finishes, in, in some ways when um, the next phase of work starts, which is documenting the project so you can actually talk about it later. Um, and so these photographs are the ones taken by Nick Granlees in the photo here. And we'd like to think that there's, um, you know, between the uh, old building and the new building, that there is actually a, um, you know, a conversation about brickness, that this is, this is a white painted brick building, this is a, actually a face, uh, face brick building and that there's like we're continuing the, all the little essays uh, about brickness and masonry sort of continuing already existing in the street. This is the screensaver for bad days. And you know some detailed shots that people don't see very much about the house. And so this is maybe one of the the pictures of that that shows a bit this idea about inside and outside. So while the house is does say hello very loudly on the outside, it in fact tells you very little or nothing about what goes on inside the house. This is, um, in this particular shot, the garage door is up so that you can actually, when you're actually standing on the street, you can see how thin, I guess, the, the, um, the fabric is between like, what, what is the internal life of the people and um, that, that live there and what is actually the public life of that little little um, civic hub that, that exists around it. Uh, but and when you choose to open it up at the same time, they, they have street parties and all sorts of people that sort of like just float straight into this area and, and through the house. But there is a, um, uh, you know, I think a really nice contrast between like the cosiness and the warmth of the inside of the house and the sorts of materials that we've used in there um, as opposed to the more rugged materials that we've actually used on the outside. So it's pretty much all plywood. I know it's terribly popular, but it's pretty good. There are a lot of good reasons to use it. The um, trusses are just industrial trusses that we've powder coated, and um, a lot of this sort of black um, joinery is um, form ply, which was looks kind of cool, but is a bit of a nightmare to work with, I've got to say, because it is very bendy. And one of the nice things that Rose did when after we moved in, this is a shot of the um, old part of the house, is that she actually did make this mural. And in some ways it is their own personal little work of art. And it's to commemorate their, um, their beloved cat who, who was uh, killed towards the end of the construction process. And basically no one sees this. This is the corridor that goes to their, to their bedrooms. And it is actually a fantastic work of, you know, it's a fantastic piece of work, but you can almost not see it properly from anywhere uh, because it's actually the the space is actually so narrow so it's almost like a little secret piece of um, art they put back into their house all right and a quick look at the acute house which is a um, this is a shot from uh, the auction day basically so this is the foot we, we were the clients invited us to come and have a look at this property with them and you can see they're um, starting from scratch cheapest house in Albert Park and that probably tells you quite quite a bit about what sort of state this place was in 
So this was the existing house. And once again, this idea of like looking at the neighbours and like what, what are they doing? So on this, this side of the street that we're looking down here is actually a small street. Um, but on the, you can just see a bit of the, the barge ass kind of like flats on the right here. So they're basically big sheer walls of like four story brown brick. It's quite confronting um, on a small street. Whereas on the other side, they're like really, it's a very, it's a much wider street and they're really cute little Victorian, you know, um, weatherboard cottages. And this particular site, because it was, oh, oh yes, and this is one of the most um, well-known um, local features, which is the outside dunny of this particular house. So the, um, sorry, go back a bit. This, this is the house itself, which is microscopic anyway. There's a little lean-to bathroom there, which was hideous. There's a tiny little yard and this triangular bit right in the corner here was actually the outside toilet. And it was actually leaning over so much that before we even started work, like we had a council order placed on the site that um, the council demanded that we actually remove the toilet because it had become a um, public menace. It was leaning so far over the, um, over the footpath. And you can see here, like, just how prominent the site is, even though it's microscopic. So it's 40, um, 48 point something square metres uh, and in a really steep triangle. And you can see a lot of the places around here are, are trying to be um, heritages, let's say, in some way. But I think where they go wrong is that they're actually looking at the outside. You know, they've just put on the clothes, but they don't actually understand what they are. They've just copied um, a certain styling, but they don't understand at all what actually what that what drives it and what it's actually derived from. So I think as a result of that, you can see many buildings in you know when you're actually looking around in the streets, many buildings actually do this more, I guess, superficial. That, I mean, it's a weird thing to say about a superficial way of dressing, <laughs> as opposed to like you know a more a more sophisticated way of dressing. But you can see also that um, even though the site is very small, it's extremely prominent in the street. So it has a big personality, even though it's a tiny, tiny site. Um, plan or aerial view. So this triangle here, number 26, is our site. And this um, bit of roof that you can see here, the white bit of roof, is actually what remains of the, um, or a part of the, um, existing building that we that we've kept but you can see also there that there's we've used you know I guess we've um, taken some tips from the the context around us and we've just made a um, I guess a house a house shaped house uh, and extruded a, a sort of uh, loaf tin of house shape and sliced it across uh, Little Withers Street and what this actually results in is a, um, I guess, a sort of piggybacked building so that we can actually retain like, the, the, the whole of the existing house um, in a volumetric way. So it looks like there are actually two buildings that are clipped together rather than just facades that are sort of like stuck on another thing. These are just renderings for um, during the planning stage. It looks a little bit different like from that in the end, but no one complained. And here you can see just with the aerial view the, um, the how big these these units are in fact whoops on the smaller side of, on the small street, whereas on the very wide side of the street they they're set way back. So our context is really um, these people these people that live directly next door, and these really barge are sort of like brown flats on this side. And you can see here the slice of the slice of the loaf tin makes a much larger, larger gable facade on the side that, that faces the barjas flats and that on the other side, it is actually more housey. Things, just go quick through those and might get to the, um, to the section that externally, I think the, you know, in a similar way, we actually love the way that you can't tell what it is that's going on inside. That it is, you know, from the outside, it does look like two two little houses sort of coupling, I guess we like to call it. Um, but there has no, there is actually very very little giveaway about um, how the floor plates work, 
um, how they interact and what the actual spaces are sort of behind that facade. And so when you actually look at the section here, you'll see that we, um, what we actually had to do was divide the house into six levels. So it's actually a three-storey house done in six um, split levels. And the reason, main reason why we ended up doing that was because the site was so small, we had to uh, scrape away every little thing that was unnecessary. So no walls, no corridors, as few doors as possible, like all those things that are um, essentially sort of single use or dead space was, um, had to be completely removed because we simply didn't have room for it. And by actually using this kind of split level idea that essentially we can have a, a room per floor essentially and that separation um, uh, in level and um, area means that I guess there's a, there's a sense of um, uh, you know, articulation of that particular space but done without, without walls or doors. So you have a little bit of visual separation, but there is essentially no acoustic separation in the house, except for, I've got to say, the toilet does have a door on it. People often ask that. Um, that otherwise, they, they sort of flow from one to the other. And there is, you know, once again, sort of like thinking back to sort of a student work, that's... One of the things, I actually um, started uni at Queensland Uni and um, one of the great projects that uh, we went to see was by an architect called Russell Hall. I don't know if any of you will know him. He's probably not well known outside Brisbane actually, but he did some fantastic work. And one of the great things he did was this weird, really weird drum house for his sister, which essentially had a spiral stair that wrapped around the outside and then each each floor plate was a separate separate room. So the only thing that separated that was... Likewise, you know, and in elevation, verticality sort of separated them, but there were no other walls. Demolition, pretty easy. I'll flick through these quickly, just the construction shots. Construction was a lot of fun. And basically every single thing had to be custom made and custom fitted because there wasn't one single um, right angle really in the house. And you can also see by the... Um, size of um, the painter here, how small the um, building is. Stairs. Oh, this is Christian, who's a form, foreman on site, brilliant. And then starting to put the um, weatherboards back on. So we decided in this case to actually, um, we all loved the weatherboard so much. We actually loved the decrepitude of the old building. It was just really unfortunate we couldn't you know, no one could possibly live in such a thing. But um, we tried to salvage as much or pretty much all of that. So all the weatherboards were um, carefully taken off, labelled, stacked and stored. And then when the frame underneath was completely rebuilt because the whole thing was um, structurally unsound, the, they were put back where they originally were. So it's all the weatherboards, the, you know, we had like about half a dozen sort of street numbers, doorknobs, weird sort of pull things, there was a ladder, there was like all sorts of things and we pretty much put them all back on. First time we get a view. Stair going up. Plywood lighting going in. Smiling in the ensuite. And then the, the finished house. So from the outside, you actually see, you know, you see the idea of the houses and you see this sort of quite higgledy-piggledy kind of like series of windows that essentially um, almost like confuses what, what rooms might be behind. Like you, you actually can't understand how, how it works internally by looking at the um, configuration of windows because there's no clarity about like where the floor plates are, for example, because we've got split levels um, and it's very difficult to know which or what, what room is for what. But what it does is, I think, present a face to the street, which is, um, you know, unap unapologetic in terms of it being a contemporary building, but at the same time, you know, I'd like to think that people, when they actually see it, actually can see that there's actually a real love for the old building that was there as well, and that we're... Um, that this, this building is sort of like the child of, you know, those things rather than like a, a, a completely sort of modern building. 
So in contrast, the interiors are um, once again largely timber, so it's um, nice and warm. This is uh, after the um, clients had moved in. And that table that you can see there is the only actual piece of furniture that they could bring into the house. Every other piece of furniture, such as the, um, the couch in the corner here, is uh, all, all the furniture is actually built in because nothing would actually fit. You couldn't go to Ikea and get a couch because it would not fit in this house. Um, every, uh, almost everything had to be custom fit into each corner. So kitchen, which is literally the engine of the house, and these two um, flues that you see here, which is a little fireplace here and the range hood, actually go up into upstairs and we go there in a sec. Oops, sorry, going backwards. But this is our internal garden because we couldn't, because we use 100% of the site. There was no, there was not one single piece of dirt left. And all of it had to be used for the house because it was so tiny. So we had to make an internal garden here. So the, um, this is the, um, the client's Akeen Aquarium Keepers. And also here you can see some of the plants and things coming up here. So over time they're, they're doing what they call aquascaping. And the plants will actually grow out of the water and sort of up, these, up the balustrade. And they also have started putting in plants in the middle of the house. Whoops. And just a slice from the balcony looking out um, with the, you know, the, the warmth of the interior sort of on the one side and the uh, reasonably tough black skin on the outside. Upstairs into the um, plywood attic. It's the detail of the ensuite. Yeah, that's the lawn. <laughs> that's the closest we got to lawn. Although we did have one tiny piece of astroturf at the front door. And the balcony at the front, which uh, does feel very much like you're on a ship. So actually one little thing, a fun thing here, is that we, we use the actual thickness of the um, walls as part of the, whoops, sorry, the, this reveal here as, as a seat and this mesh here that uh, eventually they'll grow plants and things on. Of course it stops you from falling off the um, balcony but also it acts like a sort of a hammock. So in fact we've managed to sort of mine a little bit of space back from, um, from over the street to, to use as part of our seat and it actually works really well. You feel like you're a ship on a ship when you're up the front there. And yes, just a final shot of the, the insides and the outsides all together and our um, you know, gigantic power pole there that was pretty much, uh, we had such huge trouble sort of like building it around. We had to get the most ridiculous permits in order to build this house, um, is sort of our tree in this very ur urban environment. And um, that's it.